afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us here today uh, for this very important discussion on ILO Convention 190 entitled the Violence and Harassment Convention. I'm delighted to welcome such a large number of participants from diverse backgrounds, including government officials, workers and employers, civil society organizations, activists and academics, uh, not just here in the US, but around the world. We have Mexico, Thailand, uh, Burundi, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Nigeria, India, Belgium, Pakistan, all joining us today, people who are committed to promoting human rights in the world of work. As many of you may know, in June of 2019, 187 member states of the International Labor Organization had adopted Convention 190, which came into force on the 25th of June, 2021. Uh, as of today, 21 countries have ratified the convention and Canada looks likely to do so soon. I'd also like to distinguish Canada for its leadership on the Equal Pay International Coalition, uh, which addresses another, another major barrier for women to enter the workforce. Uh, this groundbreaking international labor standard addresses violence and harassment in the world of work, including gender-based violence and harassment. The webinar series, which we are doing in, uh, in um, uh, partnership with the Department of Labor, both the International Labor Organization, uh, the International Labor Affairs Bureau on the international stage, and with the Women's Bureau today across the U.S., is designed to bring insights and approaches from the Convention 190, to the efforts to prevent and address gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work, including sexual harassment across the US at the state and local level, uh, levels, and to prevent and address uh, GBVH in the world of work. We hope that this seminar will uh, inspire others uh, in the US and beyond to help create an unstoppable movement to guarantee that the world of work, no matter where you are, is free from gender-based violence and harassment. There was a pre-webinar to this uh, discussion today, and you can access that at the ILO.org slash Washington uh, website. Uh, today, we're taking a deeper dive into the legislative accomplishments in both New York and Chicago, a tale of two cities, as it were. Uh, in this collaboration with the Department of Labor, uh, we are uh, looking at uh, making more widely known to people the key principles of C-190. Um, and, and what are we going to stress today? The broad definition of violence and harassment in the world of work, um, how this, uh, this convention covers all workers, regardless of their status as an employee, an independent contractor, formal, informal, and also the definition of the world of work, which is a very broad um, definition rather than just to say the workplace itself. So, which includes places where work is uh, performed, including homes, or where domestic workers and home care workers are working themselves. Uh, some of the other interesting aspects of the convention would be brought out in the discussion, but just very quickly, there's an intersectional approach, so a strong recognition that gender, immigration status, ethnicity, religion, race, nationality, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, migration status, all contribute to the vulnerability of workers. The emphasis is also on social dialogue, that governments, workers, and employers can all play a role and engage together, and that the recognition that the impact of domestic violence on the world of work is really important that employers do need to pay attention uh, to this and provide leave and to other um, uh, rights of workers that are impacted. Uh, I think at this time, I would love to uh, be the uh, in, uh, to introduce our, uh, our two main speakers. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Ms. Thea Lee. Uh, Thea Lee was named Deputy Undersecretary for International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Labor on the 10th of May in 2021. Um, Thea has been advocating for workers' rights both domestically and internationally for over 30 years. Uh, Thea was the president of the Economic Policy Institute, a progressive pro-worker Washington think tank. Um, and an international trade economist at EPI in the 90s. Um, Thea was also at the AFL-CIO, where she served as the Deputy Chief of Staff, Policy Director, and Chief International Economist. Um, I think I would take too long to go through the entire uh, CV of Thea, but uh, obviously a very important actor in this place, and we're very happy to have Thea. So Thea, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Kevin. And what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you with this extraordinary set of folks, um, experts from around the world and workers who have fought for change. And I'm looking forward to learning from your efforts to eliminate gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. As the head of the Bureau of International Labor Affairs at the Department of Labor, or we call it ILAB, I am deeply aware that workers' ability to exercise their fundamental human rights in other parts of the world 
is inextricably connected to workers' ability to exercise those rights here in the United States of America. And therefore, it's, it's connected to the concept of decent work and social engagement that we're also talking about. We are in a global economy. And we welcome the connections and the opportunities that that creates. But we also need to make sure that the rules that we put in place governing trade, migration, and investment are designed to protect and strengthen workers' rights as well as corporate prerogatives. And that especially uh, affects women workers. And uh, as, as Ken, Kevin said, and I think it's really an important point that all these issues of identity, whether it's race or gender or migration status, are connected to each other. And that I'm really looking forward to hearing from folks on this panel about those issues, the intersectionality. We know that when workers' rights are undermined and eroded in other countries, workers' rights in our own country are also precarious. And that's why ILAB was founded 75 years ago this month to, um, to focus on that principle. So there, a lot of work was done with labor and government leaders and business leaders across the United States to help shape our engagement on the International Labor Organization's Convention 190 on violence and harassment in the world of work. The Biden administration supports the principles and strategies outlined in Convention 190 and its accompanying recommendation. And it's now our job to make sure that our laws, our regulation, our practices are compliant with the principles of C-190. We all need to work together to fight gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. One of the most effective tools to do that is to strengthen trade unions and legislation, because we know that trade union rights are a priority for ILAB, for Secretary Walsh, and for President Biden and Vice President Harris. This December, we will launch the Multilateral Partnership for Organizing Worker Empowerment Rights. We call it MPOWER for short. This is a global initiative that unites governments, unions, labor academics, philanthropy, and civil society organizations that are committed to upholding and promoting worker empowerment and rights. One of our most recent lessons from Empower comes from Lesotho, where a campaign to address gender-based violence and harassment resulted in two negotiated and enforceable agreements. These agreements cover 10,000 garment workers and require the factory owners to mandate education and awareness trainings for all employees and managers, an independent reporting and monitoring system and remedies for abusive behavior. This is just one example of a strategy that makes concrete improvements in worker rights and livelihoods. And we are looking forward to learning more, including through conversations like today's. Your insights will help inform iLab's work to combat gender-based violence and harassment and advance trade union rights. Thank you so much to all of you for your work and for sharing your expertise to make the world of work a more equitable place. And I look forward to hearing from the rest of you and especially about the work that's been done in New York and Chicago. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thea, thank you very much. Um, before I turn to Wendy Chun Hun, I'd like to ask the interpreter uh, to give just a brief explanation of the services that are available today from English into Spanish and from Spanish into English. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. If you are listening in Spanish, you will already have been hearing my partner uh, Magdalena working, and we are going to have a speaker in Spanish later. So if you will be needing English interpretation at that time uh, on a computer, please click the globe icon along the bottom of your screen that may be hiding if your screen is not full sized, and then select your language. On a mobile device, locate the three dots that should be in the corner of your screen. And then from that menu, select language interpretation. We're about in the middle of the page here. Uh, and then choose your language and click done. Do not select mute original audio on either computer or audio. And I will now read these instructions in Spanish. Buenos días, buenas tardes. Si desean escuchar la reunión de hoy con interpretación al español y están en una computadora, Hagan clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla y seleccionen el idioma que quiera. En un dispositivo móvil, busquen los tres puntos en la esquina de la pantalla, haga clic en ellos, luego seleccione Language Interpretation, Interpretación de Idiomas, elija su idioma, haga clic en Done, o finalizado, arriba a la derecha. No debe seleccionar Silenciar Audio Original. Thank you. Back to the program. Thank you very much. And it is my great honor now to introduce Wendy Chun Hun. Uh, Wendy Chun Hun serves as the 20th director of the Women's Bureau, appointed by President Biden on the 1st of February, 2021. 
Wendy is a skilled coalition builder, bridging strategies across grassroots community organizing, the public sector policymaking, and at state and national levels. Uh, she has held senior positions in the Maryland state government and private philanthropy, overseeing large-scale results-driven initiatives for workers and family economic justice. For the past 10 years, Wendy's led Family Values at Work, a national network of grassroots coalitions that have won more than 60 new paid leave policies, bringing rights to 55 million workers and their loved ones, and are organizing to win greater access to child care, fair wages, and employment conditions for workers. Wendy spearheaded the development of the Family Justice Network, building cross-movement organizing among paid leave advocates, communities of color, groups of working for reproductive and disability justice, equality for LGBTQ individuals, and organized labor, and has made inclusive family recognition a hallmark of the paid leave movement. Wendy, it's a great pleasure to have you here and so happy to be working with you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to the ILO for inviting me to be here from the U.S. Department of Labor Women's Bureau, where for over 100 years, we've advocated for women workers' rights. Um, in its early days, the Women's Bureau rolled out report after report exposing dangerous working conditions that many women faced in job sites like textile factories. And so today, we really continue to ring that alarm about safety and really laser focusing on gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work which is pervasive across all types of industries and jobs and work arrangements. Um, and as Thea, our colleague noted, and as President Biden has cited, between half and three quarters of all women in the United States report that they have faced some form of sexual harassment in the workplace. And so Convention 190 really gives us a framing for this critical issue. Gender-based violence and harassment is an absolute affront to human rights. It's a manifestation of discrimination. It's a threat to women's economic security and health and well-being. And the risk of gender-based violence and harassment is especially high for work workers in low-wage occupations, in isolated workspaces, and workers in also male-dominated fields. Uh, just last month at our Equity and Focus Summit, we heard from numerous women who work in the building trades about the widespread violence and harassment in their industries, including the different types of violence that queer and trans workers experience. Workers in customer-facing jobs also experience high rates of gender-based violence and harassment, with worker surveys finding an estimated 60% of women in the restaurant industry, close to 60% of hotel workers experiencing sexual, sexual harassment at work. And as Convention 190 recognizes, domestic violence too has serious impacts on the world of work. The CDC estimates that more than 500,000 women will miss work each year due to domestic violence. So one of the innovations of Convention 190 is that it provides a model for the ecosystem that's really needed to eliminate violence and harassment in the world of work. Comprehensive legislation and policy are foundations of this model, and we are pleased that there's been progress, thanks in large part to the survivors and advocates who push for change. Uh, a recently released report from the National Women's Law Center found that in the five years since the Me Too movement alone, 22 states and the District of Columbia have passed a total of more than 70 workplace anti-harassment bills. The Biden administration has also demonstrated a fierce commitment to ending gender-based violence and harassment through the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act and the signing of the Ending Forced Arbitration and sexual, of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act into law earlier this year. The administration is also developing the first ever United States National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence. In addition to laws, Convention 190 also speaks about the role that employers of employers in the prevention of violence and harassment. For example, during the Department of Labor and Department of Transportation's Day of Action to Prevent Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment in the Trucking Industry, which was this past April, employers committed to taking concrete sector-specific actions to make work safer for drivers. And while this was a small step to addressing the rampant sexual violence in this industry, it does reflect a growing awareness that employers have a responsibility in ending gender-based violence and harassment, in changing cultural norms, and in accelerating social change. Lastly, as our colleague Deputy Secretary Lee emphasized, unions can be one of our strongest tools to ending GBVH. 
consultation and close collaboration with unions and workers is going to be fundamental in developing workplace policies and laws. And unions, along with civil society, play an equally important role in helping survivors obtain justice. Overall, conversations like today's with survivors and workers and unions and employers and government and advocates together at the same table, these are the keys for making things, making change happen. We're so honored to be united with you all, and we look forward to learning about and uplifting best practices to end violence and harassment in the world of work. And with that, I am pleased to turn it over to Robin Rungi from the ILO, who will serve as our moderator for both conversations today. Uh, Robin Rungi is a consultant and law professor with over 25 years of experience advocating for low-wage worker rights in the United States and around the globe with a focus on promoting gender equity and equality and preventing and addressing gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, she was directly involved in the successful global campaign for ILO's Convention 190 as the co-director of the Equality and Inclusion Department at the Solidarity Center. From 2013 to 2017, she also served in the Civil Rights Center and Wage and Hour Division right here at the United States Department of Labor. And since 2005, she has taught at the George Washington University School of Law. Welcome, Robin. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you, Kevin, Thea, and Wendy for that tremendous uh, introduction and framing for our conversation today. It is truly my honor and privilege to guide us through this conversation with some of my sheroes and heroes um, who are fighting every day to ensure that our workplaces are safe from gender-based violence and harassment. Um, I can't say enough um, how excited I am to learn from all of you, and I think we all are, um, about how coming together um, in these tripartite models of government, employers, and workers' rights organizations that we can see through change. And as Kevin and Thea and Wendy all said, what is so exciting is that ILO Convention 190, which the Biden administration has supported, really gives great frame and principles for, for building. And we're already seeing that in Chicago and in New York. Um, and we're gonna hear more about that. So let me start um, by introducing our first uh, panel, which is our, our sisters from, uh, from New York City. Um, and it truly is um, my honor and privilege. Um, we have quite a phenomenal group of folks with us today. We have council member Shahana Hanif, from District 39 in New York City. Thank you, council member, for being here. We have Kenya Williams, who um, is a nanny and a WeRise trainer. We're gonna hear about what WeRise is. So thank you so much for being here, Kenya. We have Doris Tapia, who is um, from WeRise and a lead trainer with the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Carroll Gardens Association. And we have Tatiana Behar, who's a New York City lead organizer for Hand in Hand, uh, the Domestic Employers Network. And what, what I understand, and I just want to provide a little background before I jump into questions with all of you, is that all of you for years have been working together um, to achieve an amazing accomplishment, uh, which started with organizing and workers and government and employers coming together, really um, focused on building power um, for the passage and the implementation of legislation in New York City called Intro 339 which amended the New York human rights law. Um, and the New York human rights law prohibited previously, among other things, discrimination in the workplace based on gender, sexual harassment, and your status as a victim of domestic violence, stalking, and other sexual offenses. However, these protections did not previously extend to all workers and all workplaces. And so these wonderful uh, women came together to draft and advocate for intro 339 to amend the New York City human rights law to extend these protections to nannies, caregivers, and domestic workers, as well as to require employers to provide annual trainings to their employees about their rights to be free from sexual harassment. They created a coalition, which we're gonna hear more about, how they did that, how they built this power, and how they work closely with the council member who's carrying on this work and really understands the importance of this and is committed to, to this work, which is it's just unbelievably tremendous. So um, I'm gonna ask a series of questions of this group of phenomenal women with the goal of really helping us better understand and explore how 339 embodies many of the principles of Convention 190, which is 
ensuring that all workers, regardless of contractual status and regardless of where they work, have protections from forms of gender-based violence and harassment. The importance of training and education around those rights, that is worker-led, the need to prevent and address forms of gender-based violence and harassment in all workplaces, wherever work is performed, including um, in homes, and the relationship between particularly these groups of workers who are vulnerable because of the nature of the work that they do in gender-based violence and harassment. So I'm gonna start by um, asking um, Tatiana and Doris, but Tatiana, we'll start with you, to share with us a little bit about the journey that um, you all went on together, including the leadership development, the roundtables you did with prospective council members, the reaching out to women who are employers, women who are workers, women who are council members um, across class who have all experienced forms of gender-based violence and harassment, including sexual harassment, um, to help us understand how that led to this phenomenal achievement. Go ahead, Tatiana. Sure, thank you uh, for the introduction and for this invitation. It's really an honor to be here with you all. Uh, I want to also recognize all domestic workers, the nannies, house cleaners, at home attendants, as well as employers and everyone who provides care and receives care who are on this call. I'm really excited to talk about all this, about this journey, this, this, this uh, building of this uh, organizing model, but I also want a little, to talk a little bit about history and a context to better understand where, why we are where we are right now. Now, um, last week um, on October 13, we celebrated Dorothy Bolton's day. Dorothy Bolton was a black woman from the South, a house cleaner who mobilized over 10,000 domestic workers in the 1960s to create the first union, the domestic work, the National Domestic Workers Union. No, and that was a fight that was part also of the civil rights movement. Um, so these stories of these workers are really connected with our stories and the struggles to win human rights for all. Uh, and more recently, our organizing model actually started when domestic workers won their first ever Bill of Rights in New York and the first in the United States in 2010. No, um, and that was the start of like a, a new and, and powerful and united model led by domestic workers with the support and organizing of their employers and allies. Much more recently, when COVID-19 hit in New York, now it exposed really all the inequalities faced by the workforces that were considered essential, no? that make our city work function. But these, these, these inequalities, for example, the lack of safety net, wage theft, gender violence, and all forms of discrimination deepen domestic workers into poverty during the pandemic. That was the moment in which we realized we really need to come together with specific goals. We were trying to pass intro 339, this bill that will protect uh, domestic workers from discriminations in the workplace. And even with the worst times in COVID-19, still the speaker of city council was refusing to pass this bill. So we came together um, and created and launched the New York City Coalition for Domestic Work, for, led by the National Domestic Workers Alliance, ADICAR, Carroll Gardens Associations, and Hand in Hand as the employer organization. We came together to fix what was wrong, the historic exclusion of domestic workers from human rights protection. And that's how we created our first care platform in New York City that aims to break the isolation of domestic work that happens behind doors. All these working practices happens behind doors in people's private homes, you know, um, in people's, people or employers who may not consider themselves employers, right? They may not understand that they have obligations and responsibilities when they hire home, someone at home and their homes are actually someone's workplace. So our coalition um, goals are to educate workers about their rights, uh, educate employers about their obligations and together change the cultural norms so we can live in caring communities and enjoy care as a sector that could be fair and sustainable for all. So how we did that, that this journey really has been a transformational journey for many of us, right? Uh, domestic um, work, touches all, all of us, all our lives. And most of people involved in domestic work, as we know historically, have been women, no? So women in many sectors, in many aspects, has been discriminated. And 
together as, as a groups of women from different backgrounds, different classes, different races, um, have come together with the goal to connect our stories, connect, connect deeply in how we can together fix what is wrong. And passing Intro 339 um, uh, have been really historic in, in, in New York City, especially in a city that is so diverse, right? We have uh, created conversations to talk about how an employer of a black worker can be in solidarity, can be an ally in black lives matter times. Right? How, what, what about extending basic leave? It's not enough five days a year when we as employees in our own workplaces can enjoy even a mental day, mental health day, right? So what we want is to really understand that when we advance the human rights of the most vulnerable women, we are advancing the rights of all women in New York City. And this means that adopting and bringing home international human rights and women's rights principles, especially in a, in a country like the United States in which we still really need to make law these principles, especially at the local level. This is when grassroots organizing, neighborhood organizing is how we started organizing in their homes, in our, in our living rooms, in our neighborhood, bringing together everyone. That's how we envision, that's what we seek developing, building caring communities, inviting government officials, elected officials to understand these issues, because this is the only way in which we are going to really end all these different barriers, right, that, that prevent women, in particular women of color and immigrant women who are the majority in domestic work and care sector to enjoy fully human rights. Thank you so much. Tatiana, um, it's just incredibly inspiring to, to hear and to hear the how, right? In addition to the what, the how is really part of the mystery sometimes. And yet your explanation is so powerful in showing how coming together, right? And how working hand in hand, right? Is so essential to this success. Um, even during, as you point out, a really incredibly um, difficult and dangerous time during COVID. Um, so thank you so much for helping us understand the history that led to um, intro 339. Um, Doris, I, I wanted to turn to you next and build on that and ask you, why was it important to ensure that domestic workers have protections from forms of gender-based violence and harassment? Uh, buenos días, ¿cómo están? Eh, mi nombre es Doris Tapia. Um, como explicó Tatiana, eh, la intro 339 lo, nos da las protecciones contra la discriminación y el acoso sexual para las trabajadoras del hogar ahora en Nueva York. Eh, pues vimos la necesidad urgente de que esto um, se haya aprobado porque se presentaron muchos casos, sobre todo en nuestra industria, que somos trabajadoras del hogar y solamente es una persona en su mayoría la que va al, al lugar de trabajo. A veces son solo dos. Entonces, eh, pues se vieron casos de que ellas iban tra al trabajo y pues se sentían esa incomodidad de repente. Eh, no era muchas veces físico, pero son las miradas, son las maneras en que te hablan y como lo mencionaban hace un momento, eh, en los trabajos no tradicionales también se ve mucho esto, ¿no? Eh, eh, las mujeres que trabajan en el sector eh, de construcción, donde la mayoría son trabajadores eh, varones. Entonces, para nosotros fue una necesidad de que las mujeres, las trabajadoras tuvieran esta protección, tuvieran esa tranquilidad de ir a sus lugares de trabajo con la mente más um, libre eh, de, de poder hacer este trabajo en paz. Entonces, eh, nosotros en la organización, um, yo soy miembro de la Alianza Nacional de Trabajadoras del Hogar y eh, soy miembro líder de una de las afiliadas, que es eh, Carol Garden Annie Association. Entonces, eh, allí nosotros, uh, junto con We Rise, que es un programa que... Um, empodera um, a trabajadoras del hogar, les damos capacitaciones en muchas áreas, son 11 módulos que nosotros hacemos, 
y uno de ellos es justamente prevención contra el acoso sexual. Entonces nosotros les, les damos capacitaciones para que ellas puedan identificar estos signos eh, de, de acoso, ¿no? para que ellas puedan hacer un reporte de, de estos momentos que para ellas es incómoda. No es justo que una persona vaya a su hogar de trabajo y tenga esa, esa sensación de que no está segura. Entonces, eh, nosotros ayudamos a estas personas a, a que identifiquen esto, vean qué tan alto es el riesgo. Entonces, podemos um, ayudarlas a que hagan su... su um, me he olvidado la palabra complain, <ríe> su queja. Eh, entonces, podemos uh, trabajar con ellas. Uh, generalmente se ve que el acoso sexual puede causar muchas cosas, puede causar uh, ausencias o renuncias, ya quieren dejar el trabajo, hay baja productividad, es, es una moral muy bajita y, y queremos a nuestras trabajadoras eh, en buenas condiciones. Um, yo pienso que este trabajo que hemos eh, ido haciendo con uh, We Rise junto con la coalición eh, para que se aprobara esta ley en Nueva York, la intro 339, que de hecho ha entrado en vigencia el 12 de marzo de este año, del 2022, eh, y bajo la, al, la ley de derechos humanos de la ciudad de Nueva York, estamos protegidas. Entonces podemos eh, trabajar eh, libres de discriminación y eh, sin temor a que el empleador presente represalias. Um, Asimismo, los trabajadores también pueden tener uh, derecho a recibir acomodaciones razonables. Gracias. Thank you so much, Doris, for helping us better understand the risk factors, right, for domestic workers that you had identified, you know, being isolated, working alone, working in people's homes, and then the process, right, and the importance of these protections. Um, and the leadership, right, of the different organizations involved that make that possible. I think it really makes it, it real. And, and as you said, everyone has a right to work free from gender-based violence and harassment. So it was really exciting to hear. Um, Kenya, I wanted to work, move on to you next. Um, can you share with us um, in, in your role now that we have a better understanding of the different players here your, your sister Doris did a great job of helping us understand what We Rise is and their role, right? And Carol Gardens, and, and we know you're a Will, We Rise trainer, a key, yes. key person in this. So we'd love to hear from you about what you did to advocate for Intro 339 and who were your allies and what was your strategy? Oh, uh, well, thank you. And it's an honor to be included in this uh, wonderful group of people. What was my strategy is I just embodied the people from my past. Being a part of the Rewise Nanny training um, program, like Doris mentioned, we empower our fellow domestic workers and try to provide them with the best knowledge to go out and advocate for themselves along with other domestic workers. So when I say I, I draw on people from my past, you have somebody in your family who started off in the domestic work industry. And back then in the 30s and 40s, even then they knew that they deserved better treatment and they formed and they demanded and they received better treatment. So when it was time to advocate for intro 339, that's what I tried to embody when my fellow domestic workers would approach me and ask me, well, who, how do we do this? Who do, who do we approach? And I would tell them, uh, don't just stop at approaching nannies. We signed petitions. We made phone calls. We did rallies in front of city hall. You can think outside the box is what, what I did and which I encourage my fellow domestic workers to do as well. Meaning that not only did I ask my domestic workers, I also asked my work families. I went to them and I told them, I said, listen, I'm working on this. I would like your help. Can you please sign this petition? 
they signed. Not only did they sign, they passed it on to other families for them to sign as well. When I reached out, asked them to make phone calls. So that's what I mean. We're all a community and we all deserve to work in a safe place. But not only that, we deserve to know that if something happens to us at our workplace, that we won't be discriminated against. We won't be retaliated against in any way. We won't be threatened to um, be fired because we spoke up for ourselves. So I'm very happy I and honored that I got to work on the Intro 339 through the Care Forward program, like Tatiana mentioned, uh, working with Hand in Hand, NDWA, and Carol Gardens Manners Association. I'm very proud to be a member of, and uh, I'm just look forward to making this topic known, and I'm glad that it's being spoken about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kenya for sharing that and really helping us understand your strategy, right? Like, what did you bring to this? And I really appreciate how you highlighted that you, you define family broadly, right? Your, your sisters in the work, but the families you work for. And, and that really highlights that we all have the same goal, right? Which is making people safe. Um, and, and I'm sure that you are part of the reason why this happened. I can just tell, um, you know, if you came to me with a petition, Right, and you help me understand. So I'm sure your sisters are also very appreciative of your, your leadership. Thank you so much for sharing. I now wanna to turn to council member Hanif. Thank you so much for joining us today, council member. I know um, you have a long-term commitment to the issues we're talking about today. Um, and I uh, it would be great if you could share just a little bit about your commitment to ending gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work and how you see your work collaborating and supporting this um, effort that we're talking about and the implementation now, right, of Intro 339 um, is a critical part of that. Thank you so much for extending an invitation to me to join this uh, conversation um, with folks I deeply, deeply respect and admire and whose work I've been following before I became a legislator. And so I've got deep gratitude to um, the work that uh, domestic workers have led. And for so many years, um, I am of Bangladeshi descent and some of the early organizing that I learned about uh, from women in my community was for the passage of the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. And so to know that this work has from the beginning been one that is multiracial and cross class and across languages is really a model of how organizing um, is done and how we win. And so I just wanna thank um, Tatiana, Kenya and Doris uh, for all of your contributions. I you know, like to say Robin that I'm new um, to this, this side of the work and uh, so I'm catching up and learning a lot to really uh, make sure that my framework and uh, my guiding principles are really led by a pro-work, pro-worker uh, model and recognizing that, you know, what I'm out here to do is um, to follow the lead of working class people and particularly working class women. And so, uh, I wanted to acknowledge that just as a framing of how I'm coming into my role. I've been in my seat for uh, 10 months now, and um, there are so many muscles to build. And I think just that foundation of recognizing that I'm here to really dismantle the ways in which legislation and budgets have passed. By default, the way governing and governance happens is deeply patriarchal. It by default is not gender responsive, by default is not feminist, and by default is not anti-racist. And so acknowledging all of that um, could probably allow our audience to understand that this is a big task. Um, that uh, myself and so many of my new colleagues in this cohort of the city of New York City Council, which, by the way, is um, 
a, a women majority and women of color in particular um, is really significant that we are not going to lead in uh, in the in the ways that governance has happened um, and really dismantling the sexism and the misogyny of governing is really critical to that work and that is um, why I know that as I continue to um, get acclimated in this this position, which is one that is you know deeply politically charged, and there are so many interests coming at us, um, and a lot of big dollars being thrown around, and right wing forces um, pressuring on how um, uh, how to reinforce this capitalist model of the workforce and what productivity looks like and the erasure of the care economy um, is, is one that I take very, very seriously and why I know this inside outside strategy that um, the, the work that uh, Tatiana, Kenya and Doris have embarked on um, is how we will continue to win. And so um, I think as a legislator, just confirming that uh, enacting feminist policy is difficult is really important for me. And, and so I'm coming after this incredible leadership of the three women here and um, the years that it took to pass uh, intro 339. And so I, um, as somebody who's got the, the grounding through uh, seeing Bangladeshi feminists in my community lead, uh, lead and demand more as care workers to then coming into, I used to be a former staffer in city government and got acquainted with the Cal Gardens Association and all of the work that they were doing uh, many years ago, um, to also being a survivor of lupus and uh, with background in um, uh, destigmatizing conversations of gender-based violence within the Muslim community um, are really critical to the work that I, I do right now. And acknowledging that in this moment, as we're compounded with multiple global health crises and uh, not to mention COVID, um, the, our communities recognize the importance of care work and care workers, and that it cannot be one that is unpaid. And it can, it, and it must acknowledge um, how disproportionately it is one where women of color are serving. And so um, as I think about the continuation of our collective leadership, um, acknowledging that uh, we must advance a pro-worker agenda that is feminist is important and that is led with workers by workers is important. Um, so some additional uh, uh, legislation that I'm also um, uh, working on include uh, the expansion of New York City's uh, paid sick and safe leave. And so right now, um, independent contractors or gig workers are excluded from New York's paid time off. And, you know, when COVID began, uh, essential workers were cheered on and there was lots of pots and pans uh, clamoring at 7 p.m. every single day. And, uh, and yet undocumented workers or workers who um, are independent contractors and don't have the security of uh, employee status were forced to work every day, no matter if they were sick or um, got into a crash or whatever. And uh, this, this legislation would guarantee paid time off and the safe leave part um, references uh, the safety net that is um, that survivors of domestic violence or gender-based violence would need um, uh, to secure with time off. And so this is a gender responsive um, policy uh, uh, proposal that is gonna take a lot of organizing to implement because of these big interests, corporate interests. Um, and so my hope is that um, as we uh, continue the fight to ensure that 339 is implemented, that we're also looking for broader 
uh, policy um, solutions that uh, are really looking out for workers, uh, working class workers, and also pairing in um, the fight uh, in the face of gender-based violence that directly address what happens when survivors um, have to uh, take time off for legal planning or safety planning for themselves or their family members. And so um, this is uh, of a ut utmost importance and it's something that I'm really looking forward to engaging uh, our communities on. Thank you so much, a council member. Just your leadership is tremendous, right? And hearing how you are centering the voices and experiences of workers, including our sisters here today, is just so inspiring and you know, really does replicate, right? What Convention 190 represents. It, it was negotiated globally, right? By employers and governments and workers together. And it is a very worker-centered uh, document. So I just wanna thank you so much for your leadership and your commitment. And then um, the legislation that you finished your comments with is, is again, so directly relevant. As um, Wendy said in her opening remarks, Convention 190 specifically recognizes the impact of domestic violence on the world of work and one of the recommendations is basically what we call in the states safe time, right? Safe days, but time away from work um, to address the victimization and not being discriminated against on based on your status, right? And so, um, you know, that is just um, so remarkable to hear about that work and your continued support for now the implementation of this tremendous uh, amendment to the New York Human Rights Law to make sure that all workers are included. So I just I wanna thank um, Tatiana and Doris and Kenya um, and council member Henny for sharing um, this journey and, and also really helping us understand the power and the importance of collaborative work and building coalition and building power together, um, workers, employers and government leaders <laughs> together, right? Like this isn't gonna happen any other way. And then as you just said, and I wanna lift that up, council member is, that all these partners are centering the needs uh, and experiences of workers together. Um, and I think that's when we see the most effective legislative change, such as, as the amendment to New York human rights law to make sure that it's covering all workers and particularly uh, domestic workers. So thank you. So I wanna um, engage our audience um, and I'm gonna ask my colleague from the ILO to help me with this. Um, if you all could take out your cameras, we're going to ask you a question. We're going to ask it in English, and then we're going to ask it in Spanish to see um, how, what folks are are taking away from this and how they're going to how you're going to bring this with you. So um, you can see on your screen that we're going to have this question in English first, I believe. So there's the QR code. So if you show your phone camera, I'm going to do it because I want to do it too. Um, right, show your camera to the QR code. We all learn, I learned this during the pandemic, I confess. And then click on the link that appears. It will pop up a question for you to answer. And then the results will appear real time as people answer the question. So the question is, what aspects of the New York City experience addressing gender-based violence in the world of work are most promising for your work? And here we have the examples. Oh, so far, a lot of people are saying collaboration among representatives of employers, government and workers. Wow, this is amazing to watch this real time, by the way. Right, and then we see expansion of law to include all workers is a huge feature. Mandatory training, coalition building. Yeah, so clearly what, what we learned from this is the importance of that collaboration and that power building together in that tripartite structure, which is a centerpiece of the International Labor Organization and Convention 190. Um, and, and that human rights framework, right, that Tatiana talked about. All right, well, thank you for participating. And we wanna do this in Spanish next for our Folks joining us, same question, different QR codes so folks can, there we go, as people are participating. Again, it looks like that collaboration is the piece that people are really lifting up. 
Right. Well, and then creation of coalitions, right, is, is also one that people are saying is really important. And I have to say, I agree. I am inspired by Carol Gardens and Hand in Hand and Council Member Hanif. Right. So it's this collaboration, right? And I think that's what was so powerful about this conversation is we heard exactly how that happens, right? How do, how do we do that? How do we keep workers' voices centered? All right. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you again to our panelists. Um, it inspires me to want to spend some more time in New York and figure out how we can replicate this in other parts of the country. So now I want to move to our uh, panel from Chicago. Um, which is also just amazing. And to kick off this panel, um, we're fortunate um, uh, to have uh, remarks, video remarks from Mayor Lightfoot. She wasn't able to join us in person, but she generously um, has provided us with her video remarks. So we'll hear those first. Hello, everyone. I'm Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I am pleased to have this opportunity to speak at this important event, which is focused on addressing the scourge of gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. As the first black woman to serve as mayor of Chicago, one of the largest cities in the country, I'm no stranger to the harms that exist at the intersection of racism and sexism. And because of this, my administration has prioritized addressing gender-based violence in our city through a whole of government approach. Let me give you an example. We launched the Your Home is Someone's Workplace campaign, which raised awareness about the rights of domestic workers and demanded that they be treated with dignity and respect that they deserve. We also published the city's first ever citywide strategic plan to address gender-based violence and human trafficking and enhance the city's anti-sexual harassment laws by including mandatory training for supervisors and managers as well as bystander intervention training for all employees. Most recently, my administration announced paid parental leave for all city employees effective January 1, 2023. Importantly, this policy applies to both the birthing and non-birthing parents. So while more hard work remains, I am proud of the efforts Chicago has undertaken to eradicate gender-based violence and harassment in the workplace. And I'm also pleased that these efforts are in line with the principles of the ILO's 2019 Violence and Harassment Convention, which calls on leaders to protect all workers, implement proactive policies, and collaborate with workers, their unions, and businesses to address and prevent gender-based violence and harassment in the workplace. As we continue to recover from the pandemic, which shined an important spotlight on the gender and racial inequities in our labor market and our society at large, we must continue this important work and create workspaces that are free from violence and harassment. So thank you all for being a part of this mission. I hope that you have a productive roundtable. Thank you. We truly appreciate the mayor's commitment to um, ending gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work and, and her sending along those important remarks. Again, leadership, right? Leadership from the government is really critical. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce our next uh, panel of amazing folks from uh, Chicago. We have Darcy Flynn, who is the director of the Gender-Based Violence Strategy and Policy Office of the mayor. Um, and we have Roshonda Williams, who is a leader in efforts to end gender-based violence and harassment in her union, Unite Here, Local One. Um, and we have uh, George Jordan, who's um, uh, president of Oxford Hotels um, and Resorts and the general manager for the Chicago area hotel cluster. And so we're really thankful to have all three of them here to share with us both more about the leadership and the initiatives that the mayor just shared with us but also a particular campaign that started back in 2017, led by Unite Here um, to address gender-based violence and harassment. Both of these efforts really lift up again, the, the themes and, this, and the language that is in ILO Convention 190. Um, and we'll hear that in, in that both of these really are looking intersectionally at these issues, bringing the tripartite partners together to work on these issues to benefit all workers 
Um, and that, that the campaigns and efforts um, here are worker-led and integrate that broader definition of gender-based violence and harassment, understand the intersectionality. So with that, I, I want to start with you, Rishanda, um, and, and have you share with us and describe how this campaign, which became known um, as Hands Off, Pants On, how did that come about? Um, and how did it lead to the citywide legislation mandating that workers in hotels and casinos have panic buttons? Well, first of all, thank you, Robin, for inviting me to be a part of this important and necessary conversation with uh, all of these other amazing panelists. Um, as a hospitality union, uh, we are majority women, women of color and immigrants. We've heard stories over the years of sexual harassment by guests, but we heard one particularly egregious story that prompted us to take a closer look. Um, in 2016, Unite Here Local One conducted a survey of nearly 500 women working in the Chicagoland hotels and casinos. The survey was led by members of our union, women who work in hospitality industry. What we found is that 58% of hotel workers had had an experience of being sexually harassed by a guest. 49% <clears throat> of hotel housekeepers had had a guest expose themselves, flash them, or answer the door naked. The results of the survey indicated that this was not just one bad apple, but that this was a widespread problem. So we decided to pursue legislation to address this particular issue. With the leadership of the Chicago Federation of Labor, we drafted and advocated for the hands off pants on ordinance or HOPO for short. The ordinance unanimously approved by the Chicago City Council in 2017 ensures that all hotel workers who work alone in guest rooms and restrooms are equipped with a panic button. And I'll explain what a panic button is. It also requires that hotels establish a written anti-sexual harassment policy that specifically addresses sexual harassment by guests. And perhaps most importantly, the ordinance protects all of us hotel workers from retaliation when we come forward about guest harassment. I need to make it clear that Hotel house, housekeepers often work alone in intimate spaces of guest rooms where there's no surveillance cameras. In smaller hotels, women may be the only house, housekeepers assigned to the floor. Some hotels are so large, they span an entire city block. So even with multiple people on the floor, they are isolated. We got legislation passed through perseverance, right? We kept going back. We started a small group. That group continued to grow because we organized and grew because we kept having the conversation. We kept getting more people involved and we relied on our personal relationships with each other to build a movement. We also involved our men allies to help spotlight the issue and the need for legislation. We encourage you to watch the video of HOPO on our website, which featured male labor leaders from the Chicago Federation of Labor. It's a great, great video, so you all have to watch it. Watch it. it was a powerful message for the hospitality workers and their experiences. It also helped frame the issue that it's not just a women's issue or a hotel worker's issue, but it's a safety issue that matters to the Chicago labor community. Now back to the panic button. By definition, a panic button is a portable emergency contact device that a hotel worker can quickly activate to summons a prompt on-scene assistance by hotel security or manager or other folks that are appropriated by the hotel. And that's how we got our legislation passed, Robin. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Rashonda. Um, that's amazing. Starting with the survey that you all did, right? That really, and I have to say, like, it's horrendous, right? That almost half of workers were being, you know, exposed when they're just trying to do their job, right? And being experiencing those forms of gender-based violence and harassment. And it's really empowering to hear how that led to the change with the city ordinance um, and how you built that community that you describe, right? Including yeah. male leadership in the union, right? And how that's now been in place, right? Um, for a couple of years. And so I, I really want to turn right now to, to you, George, and here as the, you know, the president of a national hotel group, love to hear your perspective on this, right? You know, this is again, one of these things that starts one way and then evolves. Could you talk with us about how you see the role of employers in your hotels in addressing gender-based violence in the world of work and how you've translated that into action, how you've seen this um, impact to your, your workplace? Absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, Karen Kent, who's the president of the local, called me a couple of weeks ago, and I guess I'm uh, one, one of the good guys. <laughs> but I say that sort of tongue in cheek because when this legislation first uh, uh, evolved in 2017, and I believe it went into effect July 1 of 2018, I was one of the guys kicking and screaming against it every step of the way. And I think the audience should understand that as a um, you know, as a capitalist, entrepreneurial, whatever, we're always responsible for the bottom line. So anytime anybody comes and tries to impose uh, something on us that's going to cost us more money, we don't like it. Uh, so I just say that right up front. But I also admit I'm a liberal lefty and I'm loving everything that I'm hearing here today. It seems to me it's it's rather bizarre that in this uh, so-called uh, Judeo-Christian world that we have to have a law or uh, other conventions passed so that people are treated with dignity and respect. But having said that, um, and having gone kicking and screaming, I will say that the panic button has actually been a roaring success here in Chicago, not only for the employees, but for the employer as well. And I dare say, um, to the extent that the uh, vast uh, traveling public understands that this is in place in Chicago, uh, it might be a countervailing uh, point regarding violence uh, in Chicago, that we also have safety in Chicago, especially if you're staying in one of our hotels. Specifically though, I would like to address that, um, you know, there's two constituents here that, that I sort of represent, both the employer and the employee. You know, for employees, it's not just a sense of safety, uh, it's a sense of inclusion that they get. Uh, somebody mentioned women, but we also have trans workers in the hotel and gay people that work in the hotel. And I think, whether you're gay or straight, black or white, male or female, whatever your gender, everybody needs to be treated with dignity and respect in the workplace. And to the extent that this law that was passed and has now been in effect for more than four years gives some added firepower to that dimension, uh, it's a win. And it's a win for the employee. And it's also a win for the employer. Because um, oddly enough, of course, uh, this kind of legislation mitigates litigation against us because we do have a duty to protect and to the extent we're uh, advocating for these types of measures, we show good faith, not only to our employees, but to the public at large. It demonstrates our concern for the employees. Um, and there is an efficiency of technology as well. We're not quite there yet. The uh, uh, panic buttons are really just a single source item. There are more elaborate schemes out there where you could try and uh, uh, toggle on work rules and this, that, and the other. But I believe it's actually against the ordinance at this point. So we have a we have a device around the neck. It's uh, you know help me, I've fallen up kind of thing. But it's really extremely accurate, right down to what part of a bedroom that an employee is in when they push the panic button. And then lastly, the uh, cost side of it, which I started off by saying I wasn't real thrilled with that. It's actually been de minimis. Um, you know, it costs a couple thousand dollars a month per for a large hotel. Uh, like a 400 or 500 room hotel, something even larger, it's even less than that on a per occupied room basis. So I think overall, the, the program has been a roaring success. And it, again, I sort of start off, it just, it goes stands to reason that people shouldn't be dropping their pants when they open the door, but I guess there are a lot of bad characters out there. And we've seen a lot more of that recently in hotels than we had in the past. So um, it's about safety for the worker. It's also safety for the employer. And again, mitigation of risk and so forth. 
I also just wanted to add a lib here a little bit. I, I thought the survey that showed collaboration as being 60% was quite interesting. Um, and the reason I think it is, is that I think the society in general just yearns for a time and place where we're not at each other's throats. Uh, anytime we can get government, labor, um, and, and commerce to work together for a common good, I, that's a win for everybody. So I'm all about that. I think that's excellent. Um, and lastly, uh, going really ad lib, there's, a, there's an election coming up. We need everybody to get out there and vote. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, George. And it's really meaningful, right, for everyone to hear, like, from, from your perspective, how beneficial these have been. And I really also appreciate you addressing the cost issue, right, that's often raised as a barrier and the benefits, right, creating what, as you said, workplaces that are safe, everyone has a right to dignity in their, in their workplaces is, is so tremendous. So I really appreciate that. I want to turn now to Darcy from the mayor's office. And, you know, we heard about the mayor's um, incredibly strong commitment to addressing gender-based violence and harassment, including in the world of work. Um, and I know that, you know, you all are supporting the panic button implementation, but also in your role as director of strategy and policy, I'd love to hear more about the, um, the initiative that she mentioned in her remarks, right? This whole of government approach to ending gender-based violence and trafficking with this strategy. Um, and and what, how is that commitment? That's one example, I guess, of how our commitment is being put into action. And then other examples that you wanna share with us. Absolutely, and thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to kind of double click and, and do a deeper dive into some of the things that uh, Mayor Lightfoot shared. Um, and it's really just a testament to her leadership and commitment in this space. Um, I think really like many of us throughout the pandemic, so we watched so many things be exacerbated, right? Um, and we quickly realized, one of the things we quickly realized was that the city's infrastructure to address gender-based violence, inclusive of domestic violence, sexual violence, exploitation, trafficking, workplace violence, right? The umbrella term. Um, in all of its forms was really inadequate. We had a, a strong history of, of serving survivors of domestic violence and funding support for survivors of domestic violence through one department of city government. Um, and then we had our enforcement side through, of course, the Chicago Police Department. And that was really kind of the infrastructure, right? And we just realized as acute needs kept coming, we didn't have an adequate infrastructure. And so through Mayor Lightfoot's leadership, we really kind of took a step back and said, we need to address this, but we need to first come together and bring the right people to the table to help us address this. So in um, early 2021, Mayor Lightfoot convened advocates, survivors, and city officials all together around a, the same virtual Zoom table and uh, to really better understand these issues related to gender-based violence and human trafficking. And as a result of that eight-month robust engagement with all of these stakeholders in really an unprecedented way, I can't tell you how many times throughout that process I heard advocates say, we've never had a conversation with City Hall on this topic, or I heard city officials say, I've never talked to my colleagues on this topic before. And these are kind of, as we call lifers in city government who have been here 10, 15, 20 years, um, and they've never had these conversations. So it was really unprecedented. And so as a result of all of that work, we developed, as Mayor Lightfoot said, the first strategic plan to address gender-based violence and human trafficking, really calling on all stakeholders, all departments across city government, as well as our external partners, both public and private sector um, and residents alike, right? And that um, plan kind of sets out to do three primary things. First, we need to build the muscle across city governments. I mentioned many people had not been having these conversations or didn't have the tools or resources to understand this issue. So we knew we have to build the muscle across our city government. We also knew we had to strengthen and create an ecosystem that adequately prevents gender-based violence and harassment and trafficking, but also adequately intervenes when violence does occur. And then lastly, we need to keep investing in those critical social services um, and safety net supports to support individuals and families, as well as communities who are impacted by gender-based violence. Uh, since publishing the plan, Mayor Lightfoot has uh, moved many of the strategies forward. It's a two-year plan, so we're about, we're just over a year into the plan 
plan. Um, but a couple of things legislatively that I want to highlight, uh, as she mentioned in the video, uh, we enhanced the city's anti-sexual harassment laws. Um, we looked to our, our own laws, right, and said, we need to expand this because what we heard and hear often is, I don't actually know what it looks like in, in the workplace, and I don't know what to do if and when I see it. And so we said, okay, well, what, are, what does the law say, right? What do the mandates say? And we went and we expanded the training requirements. Every employer and employee in the city of Chicago has to provide prevention training. Supervisors and managers have to receive an additional hour of training. And all city all employees across the city have to receive an hour of bystander intervention. And that last piece is critical because it's giving folks the tools and understanding to intervene before things escalate, right? To really get at that culture shift that is needed. And we have seen this be successful in places like college campuses. And so we're trying to apply that model to the workplace. We also um, in, have done a lot of work around domestic work, um, as Mayor Lightfoot said in the video remarks, um, and we've required domestic workers to have written contracts that really outline their rights in the scope of their work and give them a tool to advocate for themselves when perhaps they're not being treated appropriately in the workplace. Um, and that was after a year-long engagement with advocates and domestic workers um, to really inform what was needed on the ground for workers. And then lastly, I want to mention that, you know, we know that so long as gender inequity um, exists in systems and throughout society, gender-based violence is going to persist, right? These inequities are driving gender-based violence. And so this summer, we set out to understand the impacts of the pandemic on working women in Chicago. We intrinsically knew that women were more vulnerable prior to the pandemic kind of bearing its head, right? And we knew the national trends of women leaving the workforce in droves. But we really wanted to take a step back and understand, but what about Chicago women? How are Chicago women being impacted? And what we found was that prior to the pandemic, not surprisingly, women were more um, vulnerable than economically vulnerable than men. And we also found that women were less likely to be working. However, they were more likely to be single head of household with children, uh, making them again, driving that, fueling that economic insecurity that we know women experience. A couple of other stats that I think are, are helpful to ground us is that we found that jobs that were held by majority women made 13% less than those held by, than the kind of overall median annual earnings across all jobs in Chicago, 13% less. When we looked at majority male jobs, they made 8% more than that median annual earning, right? That pay disparity is, is really egregious. We found occupational segregation, particularly in the healthcare industry, at a time when we're in a pandemic, right? It's really important to really dive deeper into sector-specific issues. So as a result of that work, Mayor Lightfoot said, I'm going to do something now. And I'm going to link arms with workforce development practitioners. I'm going to link arms with um, employers. Um, and I'm going to link arms with my own staff, right, my own leadership. And as a result of that, she committed to a pay equity analysis for all across city government on a regular basis, not a one time thing, um, regularly to make sure we're addressing our own inequities in our in our workplace. And then she also, as she mentioned in the video, uh, passed or, or expanded our paid leave policy, right? And so again, we're really trying to drive this, this transformation in and outside of the workplace because these inequities need to be addressed in order to stop the cycle of gender-based violence and harassment that persists in our society. So again, just really honored to be here um, amongst these brilliant and tireless leaders. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Darcy, for sharing the, the mayor's leadership on these issues and the work that has already been done. I mean, I think I just want to lift up the legislation you mentioned, really expanding um, the definition of sexual harassment. Um, and that reminds me, we have all these resources on the landing page where everyone registered for this webinar. And that includes a link to the, the city of Chicago page that describes the citywide strategy that you've um, described here today as well and provides in more detail. And then um, also a link to this legislation. And I just wanna lift that up because again, what Convention 190 and the women union leaders who led that effort globally taught us, and we heard that I think from Rashonda today too, as the results of that survey you mentioned, Rashonda, is that our, our concept or understanding of, of sexual harassment previously was pretty narrow. Or, or not understood very well, right? Or was 
one definition that applies to every workplace. And what we know and we heard today is that what that looks like for different workplaces and different um, locations is different. Um, and so we have to have a broader understanding of what that looks like. And so I think that's very powerful. And so the definition of gender-based violence and harassment in the convention is inclusive of sexual harassment, of course, but it also recognizes all the other things that has, have been mentioned uh, today. And so the, and the leadership, right, from the mayor's offices is, is tremendous. And then training and education, right? We've heard this again and again and again, that people not only have rights, that they understand and feel comfortable and know that they won't be retaliated against. We heard that both from our sisters in New York and from Chicago, that that piece is also really essential, right? To know that you won't be retaliated against if you come forward and complain about, about these things. And I think part of that comes from worker-led voices, it, it, worker-led interventions and worker-led um, efforts like the ones we're talking about with Hands Off Pants On and then this amendment to the New York City Human Rights Code. So, um, you know, I really, uh, I really thank you so much. I think we have time for just one more question. And, you know, it's always dangerous to ask everybody a question, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna give it a go because I think, um, you know, you all talked about, um, uh, you know, these amazing changes in the workplace and, oh, are we, we can go to the Slido question. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Um, so Andrea has put up the second um, Slido question. Um, so this is um, as a, in response to our, our conversations today, please put your camera up to the computer. Now that you've heard two examples of successful efforts to prevent and address gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work, what additional support would help you replicate these efforts in your work? So please go ahead and put your camera up to the QR code. <laughs> All right. It's really helpful to see what would be helpful to replicate these efforts in your work. So opportunity for, for conversation with others undertaking similar efforts seems to be very popular, which is not surprising at all. There aren't a lot of opportunities, right, to dig deep like this. Um, in addition to more examples of policy or legislation. And I know um, Wendy mentioned it at the beginning, but on that landing page, we also have a compilation of laws that have been passed since Me Too five years ago that the National Women's Law Center put together we also have resources from the AFL-CIO on the landing page. So hopefully those resources will be helpful. So it looks like really opportunity for conversation with undertaking similar efforts um, is, most, uh, is most popular. And that's really helpful because I think that's uh, is something that we're committed to doing. I just wanna thank again, um, you know, uh, you, Darcy and George and Roshanda for sharing with us about the amazing work that has been and continues to go on Chicago. And I just wanna um, really recognize the, the ongoing support, right, from unions. This is not, I don't take any of this for granted, right? From unions, employers, and the government in each of these cities. I know I learned a lot um, that's gonna continue to inform um, the work that I do. And I just wanna commend you for your leadership and your ongoing work. This is really um, difficult, right? And you know, as the council member, you said so well, you know, gender responsive legislative action is what is needed to address and prevent gender-based violence and harassment. But all of you make it sound like it's easy and it's not, <laughs> it's really hard. We're talking about incredible abuses in the workplace. Um, so here's the question in uh, Spanish. Again, use the QR code with your camera. So it sounds like conversations with folks doing similar work is what people are most looking for. And that's really helpful for us to know, to try to create those environments and those opportunities. Thank you for participating in our Slido questions. Um, and thank you again to all of our wonderful panelists today. I'm going to turn it over to our fearless leader, Kevin Cassidy from the ILO to close us out. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Robin, and to all of the speakers today. Really a fascinating discussion and uh, 
always good to hear uh, what people are doing on the ground to really make changes. Sometimes when we work on policy, it's very difficult to uh, to see the work on the ground, but thank you for the inspiration on that. Just a couple of words uh, in the New York panel. So thank you, Tatiana, Doris, uh, Shahana, and Kenya. Um, what we're hearing is that, you know, these are fundamentally about human rights and labor rights. And for us, labor rights are human rights. Um, this is uh, something that's the basis for the ILO. Um, these issues cut across race and class, class ethnicity, language, status, um, and it's really important to build strong communities and family in this space. Um, there's a great deal of uh, emphasis to be put on the grassroots organizing when building this foundation for change. And we need to keep that connection between the isolation of the domestic workers in homes and housekeepers in hotels. Um, you're facing some of the same risk factors, so really being uh, sensitive to that. Um, also, advancing the rights of the most vulnerable workers advances the rights for all workers. And I think you know, our work internationally shows that as well. Um, I think employers do recognize the productivity issues involved, and there are enlightened employers there. And thanks very much to George for being here uh, and uh, being very honest with us, telling how he fought it in the beginning and is with it now. So I do appreciate that. Um, some of the other key issues that knowledge is power. So really let us let us empower ourselves and work together and build this momentum. Um, we need to think creatively, innovatively, and engage many different stakeholders. I can tell you from my experience in working in the UN system, never underestimate who could be an ally. And even those who seemingly are on the other side can be very effective in understanding what you're doing, as long as you speak to them in a way that they understand you and you understand and respect them. Uh, and then finally, to say the importance of addressing the effects of domestic violence in the world of work. Our research has shown that domestic violence spills over into the world of work, and also uh, the impact of, um, of treatment in the world of work will spill over into the domestic environment as well. Uh, for our speakers for Chicago, Darcia, Roshanda, and George, uh, this tripartite approach, workers, employers, and governments working together is very powerful and impactful. These are the actors of change. Please make that happen and please work together. Um, both uh, panels had emphasized the systemic issues are at the root of uh, GBVH and the prevalence of GBVH into the light of that it can be a powerful tool for change. Um, we need to involve men. Uh, I'm glad to see that I'm one of the few men on this panel too long in this discussion space in the UN. There have been too many mantles, and I'm glad we have gotten away from that and bringing in the powerful voices of those who can make the change. Um, to the employers, you can win when there are successful strategies that are implemented. So work together with those. You know, People who work for you are the most valuable resource you will ever have. So make sure that you work together for those goals. Government often has a unique ability to bring people together and international organizations such as the ILO, this is what we do, we have convening power. And then finally to say that everybody needs to play the role, play their role, including bystanders who can intervene. So I think with those few words, I wanna say thank you very much to all the speakers uh, for spending your time, for all the participants being here, to Robin uh, for her tireless work on this. Behind the scenes, Deborah Greenfield, who has been an amazing uh, ally and uh, former colleague of mine, uh, to Wendy Chun Hun, I really appreciate and value this partnership. Let's make change across the US today. Uh, to Thea Lee, we continue to work very strongly with the International Labor Affairs Bureau in Department of Labor. This is not something that we can settle in one country, one state, one county. We need to do this holistically. And I am standing here to say that the ILO is uh, prepared to help. Let's move this across the US. Let's do a bottom-up change of, uh, of the laws. And uh, I don't know, Wendy, did you want to have a final word before we sign off? No? OK. <laughs> no, thank you. This has been incredible. Incredible. Thank you for everybody's leadership. Great. Thank and you. I just want to put a, a, a note in everybody's ear. We have a follow-up conversation in December. So look for that email. We're going to continue this dialogue um, and really focus on education and awareness. So I'm really um, excited about that. Thank you right. all. Yeah, and, and sorry to the workers behind the scenes. So Andrea Cuba Sanchez who's running the whole thing. Thank you, uh, Andrea. And of course, to the uh, translators, uh, the interpreters yes. behind the scenes. Thank you very much, Ernest. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next iteration of this. Let's move forward together. Thank you, everyone.